ప్లాస్టి మిత్ ఆర్ యాక్చువాలిటీ and today's presenter is uh, mr g amal mohan he is an alumni of mpt 2005 batch cardio respiratory he has a diploma in rehabilitation physiotherapy from all india institute of physical medicine and rehabilitation and is currently pursuing his phd from savita university he has been a former clinician in apollo hospital chennai former assistant professor in srm college and former associate professor in tamil dr tamil nadu mgr university He is also currently working as a clinician in Government Stanley Medical College and Hospital. Apart from being a good clinician, he is also a well-known abstract artist, a short film maker, photographer and a voracious reader, also a science enthusiast. Today's session will be moderated by Subramanian sir, Principal of Balaji College of Physiotherapy. It's a great pleasure to introduce you, Amal Mohan sir. Thank Kindly you. take over. Um, good evening, everybody. so today my session would be cardiac plasticity myth or actuality probably this this topic itself might be like an abstract uh, presentation because people have heard about uh, neural plasticity but cardiac plasticity is a new term and uh, to give a brief uh, idea about what cardiac plasticity was like i was just discussing with one of my student from srm way back in 2002 or 3 uh about something about plasticity and some of pop up in my mind like something like why don't cardiac plasticity happen there and that gave a way to search what really cardiac plasticity was and there was a term which was existing which was cardiac plasticity okay before getting into plasticity a brief introduction about what plasticity is plasticity uh like uh, vs ramachandran who has written a book about phantoms in the brain way back in 1996 like i read those book i was interested in plasticity e explains the plasticity is nothing but it is also functional as well as structural change and this happens to everything there are two kinds of plasticity which happens to the organism which happens happens to the organ here in cardiac plasticity we are going to see the organ plasticity not the phenotype that is the organism plasticity right and uh, <clears throat> so heart is not just a muscular organ it can anticipate it can react and it can adapt for example you know like uh, if i'm going to stand in front of a mic and talk to people the moment i'm going to stand in front of the mic my heart is and it starts really you know like my heart beat goes up really and that is an anticipatory one and it reacts you know like once it's, it's like the heart rate goes up after anticipatory heart rate there is a reaction towards it and then once i know that the students are not going to ask questions you know like the session is going to be a simpler one it settles down right and this stimulus when it is permanent there is going to be a adaptive change and if it is you know like a simultaneous with this a short term that stimulus will not do anything to the uh, organism right so the heart is a goal seeking organ and it's a powerful organ that can adapt select a course of action out of many possible so optimize its function integrity in response to its imposed environmental stress with respect to cardiac function and hills is the one who has coined this term you know puts it more succinctly the heart is a tremendously flexible organ he says it is remodels itself to meet changing conditions very quickly and the muscle responds right so it heart is a multiple you know it's a complex adaptive organ it is complex in the sense like it has many special states go on and it is adaptive in the sense you know uh, it can adapt to any other any kind of situation it may be an environmental situation or it can be an internal environmental situation it can adapt to any kind of system so i just want to brief you about you know like the evolution of the evolution the heart started as a tubular organ and i mean you know like now it's a complex organ you know and way back i would relate all these things to gait a walking i'm more interested into something called evolutionary medicine evolutionary medicine talks about the evolution you know like a reason for what really happens and we started walking way back you know like somewhere around 3 uh, million years ago so what really happened was we were just tree climbers and once uh, lucy was the first organism to stand up right and start walking when we started walking there were a lot of changes which happened to the organism 
and those adaptive changes has changed every single organ in the body right from the musculoskeletal system to any other system in the body everything is adapted and whatever you see you see now as an adaptive changes is completely changed organs it's not the homo sapiens completely changed compared to the ergaster or the homo habilis which you saw earlier so heart assets as a change because earlier we were nutcrackers and we used to find food walking for 15 km per hour so when you now average indian walks only 0.5 km per hour see there's a drastic change you know earlier it was 15 km now it's only 0.5 km and we are designed to do more physical activity the body is designed to accommodate or adapt to a more physical activity compared to what we are right now as doing it so what really happened how did the heart accommodate right so after industrialization what really happened was you know like there was a lot of machines which came up and nothing was done by human then the machines started doing it and any kind of exertional activity landed up on some kind of medical issue which was called called as you know exertional syndrome or even there was a change in the heart which was called as athlete's heart or it was called as soldier's heart these kind of changes were been documented and they thought that it was pathology and after nearly a century the idea about cardiac pathology like the heart cardiac hypertrophy or the enlargement of heart completely changed how it trained so disevolution see disevolution in the sense you know liberman uh, he has written a good book about the story about the human body and he says that we are not completely evolved you know the evolution is not completely changed stage and there is a disevolution we our system our body is not completely adapted and we have there's a kind of disevolution i can state a good example for this evolution um uh, long uh, what uh, there's a you know nerve of branch of vagus nerve if i'm not wrong like which innervates the uh, uh, larynx long thoracic nerve if i'm not, not wrong uh, so what really happens is you know it's it's a cranial nerve which uh, innervates the larynx right from the cranial nerve it down goes down to the lung and way up it again goes up and innervates the larynx in a human you don't see there's a big change in it but in giraffe if you see it it has to travel long track go down and again innervate the uh, larynx this is a good example of disevolution so same kind of thing today's change what is required the body is not completely accommodated and there is a disevolution right so disevolution of the heart shrev states that today's epidemic of uh, physical inactivity in conjunction with the highly processed high sodium diet contributes a thicker stiffer heart that compromises the heart's ability to cope up with the endurance physical activity and importantly this may start to occur prior to the increase in the testing of resting blood pressure okay so organism phenotype and organ phenotype so what is organism phenotype organism phenotype is to the external stimuli the body reacts and there is a permanent change and uh, see for example like uh, if you must have seen the, all these japanese and chinese all these the, these people have a very smaller eyelids have you any time thought about the why these people have a smaller eyelid compared to the people uh, in anywhere else uh, there is an evolutionary reason for it those days you know like there there used to be a lot of sandstorms over there to avoid sandstorm they used to you know uh, close the eyes very narrow and this uh, caused their organism phenotype probably in next another billion years or so this kind this will completely change so when there is an external stimulus which is sustained for a longer time automatically there is a evolutionary change that is reflected in the organism that is organism phenotype and uh, what changes sustain is uh, uh, sustain is depends upon the need of the organism um, darwin states that you know like he used to say but fitter survive and uh, richard dawkins another author he states that there is something called evolutionary stable strategy only when there is a stability or when there is a need for some organism to survive this phenotype completely you know like preserves it so organs phenotype on other hand is more internal it changes according to the internal environment on other hand organism phenotype is an external environment organ phenotype is an internal environment so this is the difference between them. cardiac phenotype plasticity is characterized by change in the myocardial structure so this plasticity is nothing but the myocardial structure how it changes to different environment and what is the clinical implications these are the things which we are going to see today okay cardiac remodeling most of the authors use remodeling and plasticity synonymously and uh, remodeling can be physiological as well as biology uh, what uh, pathological condition physiological remodeling model, model remodeling is compensatory change in proportion and function of the heart this type of remodeling can be seen in athletes 
So that's what more the purpose of physical activity. These kind of changes happens in the heart, and that is more of compensatory mechanism. And it is sometimes it is most of the time good to the human being or good to the system. Pathological remodeling may occur after conditions such as myocardial infarction. These are the remodeling which might occur. So there there are two end of continuum. One is pathological and physiological. Right. So exercise, pregnancy, postnatal growth promotes physiological growth of the heart. On the other hand, old age, obesity, diabetes, uh, ischemic neurohumeral activation, hypertension, myocardial injury can cause pathological remodeling. Pathological hypertrophy can increase the risk of heart failure. So because uh, when there is an eccentric type of hypertrophy, this can lead into arrhythmias that can cause heart failures. Okay. So plasticity of the plastic morphology of the heart. It can be there are segments. So heart can atrophy or it can be normal. and there can be hypertrophy these are the three spectrums and in hypertrophy you can have concentric hypertrophy and you can have eccentric hypertrophy this concentric and eccentric can further be divided into biological that is physiological and pathological okay so when does an atrophy happen there is when there is a decrease in the cardiac mass to the level that there are well below the normal occurs in the condition of weightlessness bed rest and uh, other states of ventricular unloading In a study involving entry subjects assigned to 12 weeks of bed rest, the left ventricular mass index reduced by 15 percentage. In a study that probably defined to lower limits of the size of the atrophied heart, uh, reported 25 percent of decrease in left ventricular mass in patients with spinal cord injury. There was a person called Megdal. He took up a, a summer vacation program in 1966. The whole idea of that program was that, like, he has to take a bed rest for nearly three months. And they started evaluating all his vitals, cardiac parameters, and everything for the past six for three months. And they then they knew the ill effects of bed rest. Everything changed after that, you know, like uh, because earlier you know, most of the senior therapists and everybody knows that uh, most of the treatment for myocardial infection was bed rest. Now they don't do bed rest at all. Early activity is more, you know, like uh, it's a mantra for uh, early recovery. So atrophy can happen in weightlessness or in case of a bed rest. Where the muscle mass completely reduced, hardy cardiac muscle mass completely reduced. So concentric remodeling uh, and uh, the other what morphological patterns. So concentric remodeling is an increase in relative wall thickness, but with normal cardiac mass. There are two things: they the cardiac mass can be normal and they can be thickening. Another thing, the volume size might lower. Simply like that, you know, like uh, it is a muscular organ. When you do a you know, weight training, what really happens is the muscle mass increases. Likewise. when there is a load which is which is called as special load which is happening in the left ventricle automatically there is a concentric thickening of the uh, left ventricle concentric thickening is nothing but the sacromeres are placed adjacent to or parallel to each other and the thickness of the left ventricle increases and this is concentric hypertrophy okay on the other hand eccentric hypertrophy is a sense where the sacromeres are placed one after the other or adjacently So eccentric hypertrophy is an increase in cardiac mass with increased chamber volume. The volume of the chamber itself increases, and uh, the relative wall thickness may be normal. It might be decreased because it might be associated with concentric changes also. This growth pattern is common under conditions of isotonic exercises, volume overload, and after infarction. Okay, so these are the pictures we can see the remodeling patterns. So the atrophy is there where the size of the heart is completely reduced, and on the other hand there is a hypertrophy. so there can be physiological hypertrophy when the chamber volume increases and there can be pathological hypertrophy there might be increase beyond certain limit of increase it can cause ventricular arrhythmia that can cause cardiac failures okay so this is what which i am trying to mention so normal is normal value you can see the left right ventricle and the left ventricle and you can see the cavity in it you know the left ventricular cavity that's a normal size of a cavity arbitrarily Right. So here, on the concentric hypertrophy, the wall thickness has increased and the chamber volume has reduced, and this happens because of a pressure overload. It could be chronic hypertension or aortic stenosis. Because in case of an aortic stenosis, what happens is the left ventricle has to forcefully push the blood outside the aorta for the systemic circulation. When there is a restriction in the aorta, what automatically happens is this has to force do it, and there is a overload. This pressure can increase the thickness of the left ventricle on the other hand eccentric hypertrophy is a volume overload when there is more amount of blood pours into the left ventricle there is a dilatation and this dilatation is uh, to some extent it is good for you uh, frank starling's law you know like when there is a sudden load in increase in load there can be more amount of activity which can take in the left ventricle 
So this is a volume overload and this can also happen in pathological condition because too much of eccentric dilatation can cause arrhythmias. Right. So this is on an X-ray, sorry, uh, on a um, uh, M mode echo. So you can see the concentric hypertrophy where the chamber volume is reduced. On the other hand, there is an eccentric hypertrophy. You can see the dark shadow in between where the chamber volume is a little bit normal as well as there is thinning of the um, left ventricle. So how was left ventricle hypertrophy defined? Left ventricle hypertrophy is defined as an increase in left ventricular mass. Left ventricular mass can be calculated using left ventricular wall thickness and left ventricular cavity size measurement obtained by diastole from 2D M mode echo, motion mode echo cardiography. And this is not a job, but still, if you know this calculation, we can a little bit do it, in, you know, infer the amount of thickness. On contrary, we can identify uh, left ventricular hypertrophy either with auscultation, that's a primitive method. Uh, you just have to know where the apical impulse takes. The apical impulse, usually it is at the uh, mid-clavicular rein, around the fifth mid-clavicular, if I'm not wrong. I'm, you know, like, just slipped out of mind. Fifth mid-clavicular line. So there, uh, you can see an apical impulse. This apical impulse, if it is not felt there and elsewhere, there is a dilatation of the left ventricle. On the other hand, on an X-ray, you can see it. You can have a ratio. For example, you can take the apex of the heart and the diameter or diameter of the apex of hearts and the diameter, transthoracic diameter of the uh, water, transthoracic diameter. So the cardiac shadow has to, must be half than less that of um, uh, transthoracic diameter. So this is on an X-ray, we can simply do it. So there are two kinds of load which can cause uh, cardiac uh, hypertrophy. This is pressure overload and volume overload. Pressure overload, as I said, it, as in case of uh, aortic stenosis where there is a constriction over there, there is a stenosis. So there have to be more amount of pressure from the left ventricle that causes a pressure overload. On volume overload, there's more amount of blood flows into the left ventricle, which is volume overload. It can also happen in some kind of trivial regurgitations. Okay, so there are plenty of genes which uh, really does this kind of an hypertrophy. It is said that nearly 1,400 genes are actively participating in an, uh, uh, you know, like a hypertrophy, right? And there are some specific genes also which are very special. What really happens is um, fetal gene expression. That is, in the sense, like there are certain genes which are not active uh, during the lifetime gets activated, and there is an hypertrophy. So these genes are expressed in case when there is an hypertrophy is necessary. And microRNA can also be responsible for the hypertrophy. So exercise training regulate, regulates the cardiac microRNAs. So microRNAs are essential in different cell process involved in regulation of cardiovascular phenotypes. Such micro uh, cardiomyocyte growth, remodeling, and vascularization. MicroRNA, as I've also been described, participating in beneficial adaptation promoted by exercise training, mainly physiological as well as cardiac hypertrophy. MicroRNA, uh, you must have heard about a term called epigenetics. Epigenetics is, you know, like um, it's a field which is coming up. You know, there are, this is a part of epigenetics also. It can remodel uh, the uh, RNAs or the gene where you can have changes in the heart. So, adaptation accompanying feedback and feedback for BIRDA. Uh, there are beat to beat changes. Every beat, there is a change in the heart. And, and SA automaticity, it is sinoauricular node can also have changes. So, so what is the electric node? It is not only the left ventricle which remodels, even the SA node can remodel at times, you know, like uh, changes in the electrophysiological of the sinoauricular node is known as electrical remodeling. It is now evident that electrical remodeling is an important process that has been demonstrated in dysfunctions, sinoauricular node dysfunctions associated with heart failures, aging, diabetes, atrial fibrillation and endurance exercise. Furthermore, familial SNDs have been identified and mutation has been characterized in key pacemaker gene of SNS, SANs. Sorry. So what are the cellular adaptations which happens in your uh, um, uh, what remodeling or the plasticity? Alpha myosin AV chain isoforms and beta eosin myosin isoforms. There are two kinds of isoforms which are present. So if you see the alpha myosin AV chain, it is an IS, it has IS ATPs activity and contracted activity. Whereas beta myosin heavy chain has lowest ATPase activity and contractility. So there is a decrease in alpha to beta myosin heavy chain expression ratio and in pathological hypertrophy. So in case of a pathology, uh, alpha is replaced by beta myosin heavy chain. So if you compare alpha myosin heavy chain as 
more amount of contractual activity and utility of atp based activity is also highest and the contractual velocity is also more in alpha myosin heavy chain on contrary in case of a beta heavy chain uh, it is completely low contractile activity so in case of pathology of heart or cardiac hypertrophy pathological cardiac hypertrophy alpha is replaced by beta myosin heavy chain on contrary exercise training prevents the response the ratio of conversion from alpha to beta is reduced in case of a exercise when you do a exercise so one second right so conversion of fast myosin heavy chain to slow myosin heavy chain that's what i was explaining you so what happens is there is a reduced shortening velocity and the consumption of atp is also reduced right factors favoring cardiac auto regulation heart, heart can also auto regulate on its own these are the uh, mechanism through which cardiac auto regulation takes place this is neural mechanism endocrine mechanism and endothelium mediated control are all responsible for cardiac auto regulation okay so as as we have, we always speak about other nervous systems we don't talk about cardiac nervous system at all like there is a nervous system which is completely dominates the uh, cardiac functions alone there is a intra cardiac nervous system and an extensive network of neuron clustered in the ganglion or it is otherwise called as cardiac plexus on the surface of the heart gp neurons are the final site of neural control to the heart rhythm so from here there is a control to the heart the intrinsic cardiac nervous system is not merely a relay station involved in the central command or control but it can it is it is robust in its ability to express independent regulatory action in response to the imposed change in the cardiac cell so one one simple example which you can see excuse me see you know if you go if you have gone to a you know non vegetarians like you know if you go to a butcher shop if you see people cutting that you know i have seen it in a chicken shop when they you know like uh, cut a chicken live you can see the heart beating which is decentralized it can beats for 100 minutes and it has a, it, it is not under central control but still heart beats for 100 minutes this is because of the local control okay so remodeling of the cardiac nervous system pathological pathophysiological remodeling of uh, intra cardiac nervous system is proposed to uh, feature in multiple cardiac vascular diseases including heart failures and in atrial fibrillation okay so there is also something called uh, ischemic preconditioning of the heart so what really happens is before you have a final degree of ischemia like there's a you know micro ischemias which takes place so this heart what happens is it remembers this micro recondition and it can compensate or it can withstand a major recondition this is ischemic recondition so the capacity of the heart to adapt to ischemic stress is manifested by a phenomenon known as ischemic preconditioning during preconditioning mode a brief ischemic stress rapidly induces tolerance to the later prolonged ischemic challenge a brief period of ischemia has been shown to protect heart from more prolonged episodes of ischemia reducing infarct size and reducing the incidence and severity of reperfusion and induced arrhythmias and it also prevents endothelial dysfunction so there is another factor about heart which is called as decentralization so there are several controls for the heart in the sense like it has a central control and it has a mid level control and it has a terminal level control so mid spinal uh, the supraspinal control is from the brain so it is autonomic nervous system that controls it and there is a bot mid level central and this is the cardiac plexus and there is another central uh, reflex uh, the other system which is peripheral which is more reflexly activated there are three levels of control for the heart so superior level mid level and the middle level so intra thoracic ganglion in the heart and the interconnection coordinated with the central neurons in the spinal cord brain stem and supraspinal central neural regions modulate the autonomic control of the heart function that is as you know that the things is controlled by that as such control of heart function involves hierarchy of neurons located within the heart command that is the top level and the intra thoracic extra cardiac ganglions mid level and the cardiac ganglion bottom level so these are the three levels of control heart really has so so there is an modeling of the, of the uh, cardiac modeling which takes or the cardiac um, uh, cardiac plasticity which happens so there is a therapy called anti remodeling that is like you can remodel it anti remodeling therapy can happen with exercise so activation of physiological growth by means of exercise promotes a gene called p13k akt signaling so this gene uh, can cause a anti remodeling so exercise training induced by physiological cardiac hypertrophy presents a cardioprotective effect see when the hypertrophy takes place within the physiological limits it is more helpful to the organism so exercise can induce that kind of a physiological change 
and sometimes it is said that even the pathological change can be to extend the reversed with the exercise so exercise training has been described as being able to counteract structural and functional changes in the cardiovascular diseases by contributing the phenotypical changes of the pathological into physiological hypertrophy you can convert the pathological hypertrophy into a physiological hypertrophy okay so these are the i have told it earlier so these are the changes which happens in resistance exercise what really happens is concentric hypertrophy takes place and in this is in the middle one you can see a sedentary heart and in aerobic exercise you can see eccentric hypertrophy where there is thinning of left ventricle so these are the three spectrums as such uh, this is not a you know binary so it it can't be counted as binary like either you have concentric or it can have an eccentric it is more like a continuum so it can from a normal it can go into atrophy from a normal it can go into concentric from a normal it can also go into eccentric it's kind of a continuum it can happen at the any any part of the continuum okay anti remodeling therapy increase the contractility and the size of the myocardium that is the exercises which are happening and increasing stroke volume and cardiac output you know that you know frank uh, frank starling's law so when there is an increase in bp reduction in bp in response to increased parasympathetic activity and sinus node automaticity so when you start doing exercise you know that you know exercise induces hypotension the bp really falls down and again the stroke volume increases you know for a normal untrained individuals what really happens is cardiac output is uh, a product of stroke volume and the heart rate normal untrained individual the heart rate increases on the other hand a trained individual the stroke volume in you increases and the cardiac output increases so they tell the exercise increases the stroke volume and the contractility also increases and bp also goes down okay exercise and remodeling am i a bit fast uh, subramaniam sir subramaniam sir sir it is wonderful please go ahead okay sir fine sir fine sir okay, please sir. go ahead. thank you Fine. exercise and remodeling exercise training has been described as being able to contract structural this is the term uh, paragraph which i told all you it can cause structural as well as functional changes and two kind of exercises moderate exercise is still debate which goes on whether high intensity exercise or low intensity or moderate intensity exercise which is beneficial to the heart and the other part of the other system right like moderate intensity exercise endurance activities such as walking and running stimulates the left ventricular chamber to become larger longer and more elastic making it able to handle high volumes of blood but pressure challenges chronic weight lifting so because people do try to do more amount of val salva maneuver during the weight lifting that has to be coordinated by a trainer but you know like when the val salva maneuver increases automatically the pressure increases and that stimulates the thickening and stiffening of the left ventricle okay so morgathan hypothesis what he states is the endurance athletes presents with cardiac adaptation induced by increased volume per load uh, sir i do hear a disturbance hello sir one second sir one second yes sir now you can go ahead sir yeah fine <clears throat> so on the other hand power based athletes have a cardiac phenotype shaped by a higher pressure load so there are volume overload and uh, pressure overload this was defined by morgrothan so endurance athletes have large eccentric remodeled heart large ventricular volume modest wall thickening and low relative wall thickness associated with reduction in resting heart rate power athletes presents with concentric remodeling thick ventricular walls relative small ventricular volumes and high relative wall thickness and minimal changes in the heart rate so uh, stroke volume increases in case of an eccentric heart and uh, in case of eccentric heart which is uh, physiological and in concentric changes there is no changes in the heart and other stuff so there is volume changes is more in case of an endurance athlete here we don't see any volume changes at all in case of a concentric hypertrophy so exercise induced remodeling the left ventricular remodel induced by by physiological stimuli leads to preserved and even enhanced L lv function decreased collagen content lack of fibrosis increased angiogenesis improved cardio myocardial oxidant capacity antioxidant capacity and decreased mitochondrial dysfunction and has been shown to prevent cardiomyocyt apoptosis lv remodeling induced by pathological stress leads to progressive decline in the heart cardiac output myocardial rarefaction increased apoptosis and my cardiomyocyte metabolism switch from fatty acids to the glucose use and increased fibrosis pathological hypertrophy is associated with severe cardiovascular diseases illness 
uh, leads to increased risk of heart failures and arrhythmias. See, there is a two end where uh, uh, in case of eccentric hypertrophy is more of beneficial. In case of a uh, concentric hypertrophy, it is not that useful. And at the same time, eccentric hypertrophy, when it goes beyond the limit, normal limit, it can cause an uh, arrhythmias or it can cause dilatation of left ventricle. For example, they do a procedure called Batista procedure, where there is complete dilatation of, because when the chamber volume is huge, when the eccentric hypertrophy is beyond the limit, what happens is a normal amount of inflow of blood is inserted to the left ventricle, but the chamber is so dilated that it can't have the pressure to push it into the iota. So in that cases, they do a procedure called Batista procedure, surgical procedure, where they cut it and, you know, like resuture it, shorten it and resuture it, where the pressure can be increased. So this is uh, the two end of the concentric hypertrophy and eccentric hypertrophy. Okay. Aerobic exercise, uh, such as running, rowing, cycling is associated with uh, ECG changes, indicator of ing increase of cardiovascular mass. And see, for example, uh, this can also be seen in ex ECGs. Uh, ventricular hypertrophy can also be seen in uh, what ECGs. And uh, echocardiographic studies, uh, which also see there is a ventricular remodeling, increase in the septal thickness, ventricular wall thickness, left ventricular hypertrophy in athletes, and normal or improved ejection fraction. So ejection fraction can be same or it can be improved after exercise. In male athletes, left ventricular wall thickness may be between 12 to 16. This is the normal limit for athletes, 16 to 12, 16 mm. And in male, uh, you, uh, in male athletes and in female athletes, it is about 25% in less compared to that 12 to 16 mm. So when it is beyond 16 mm, then it might turn out to be pathological. Again, if there is an associated uh, diastolic dysfunction or systolic dysfunction associated with eccentric hypertrophy, then it has to be considered as pathological. Until if there is no dysfunctions over there or septal dysfunctions are there, we can't consider it as a pathological. This remodeling is beneficial to cardiac function and it is associated with increased oxygen delivery, angiogenesis, and nitric oxygen sensitivity. Okay, so classical physiological hypertrophy results from aerobic exercise and um, aerobic exercise training and not from resistance training. Indeed, it is important to clarify that resistance strength training actually results in classic hypertrophy and reduction in inter internal ventricular chamber dimension because too much of um, uh, what um, your concentric hypertrophy can reduce your chamber volume. The resistant training heart is therefore morphologically similar to the heart with pressure overload uh, and pathological hypertrophy. So for example, I was telling you about the aortic stenosis. It is more similar to that. And uh, it can cause dysfunctions on a long run. Okay. So apart from this, there can also be other changes in the heart. What in case of an acclimatization, altitude acclimatization, the high altitude. Okay, so there is increase. There are reversible changes. That is, that's what I was saying. When the stimulus is temporary, there is an increase in heart rate, and there is a reduction in volume, and the erythrocyte counts increases. This is a reversible change. The hypertrophy, which can happen, is a permanent change. Okay, usually, if there is a permanent change which is happening. Uh, in, in case of an acclim acclimatization or high altitude, it is a right ventricular hypertrophy which increases, right? And not the left ventricle over here because automatically there is a uh, change in the uh, what, uh, what oxygen capacity or the partial pressure of oxygen reduces in high altitude. When there's a reduction in partial pressure of oxygen, automatically there must be change over here, right? So sometimes this chronic hypoxia, when I mean, there is a, you know, like chronic hypoxia, Tibetans usually retain the gene because they live in high altitude. So this hypoxia, what are they, since they are living uh, away from the sea level, uh, far away from sea level, they have certain adaptation which is beneficial to them. You don't see very, the, the incidence of myocardial infraction or in case of hypertension is very much lesser in people who live in high altitude. So chronic hypoxia activates the uh, autonomic nervous system that changes the cardiac neural activity, which is responsible for cardiovascular adaptation to the same. Exposure to moderate chronic hypoxia may induce cardioproductive properties. So it protects certain things more than cardiac exposure. So the hypothesis put forward is that chronic hypoxia triggers regulatory pathways that mediate long-term cardiac metabolic remodeling, particularly the transcription level, right? Population residing in high altitude display lower incidence of hypertension and the mortality rate for chronic heart disease is comparatively lesser. Exposure to low PaO2 may also protect organisms which subsequently challenge with acute oxidant 
stress. For example, reduced incidence of myocardial infection is also seen in case of the high altitude, right? Okay, so we saw high altitude, and because we are always, you know, like thinking about, you know, terraforming in the mass, and you always see nowadays, you know, like way back, you know, 40 years back, it was the last day where humans, all humans, were on the earth. Apart from that, you see every day you can see ISS also, like you know, like International Space Station. A lot of researchers, exercise researchers, are also going on in space station. So there are a lot of challenges which is met by the uh, people there who are who are uh, who, who live there, you know, astronauts who live there, because the heart is the one it is synonymous to the bed rest. What really happens? There are two kinds of stress which is uh, beneficial to the organism. One is gravitational stress. Another one is your exercise stress. So when these kind of stress is completely devoid, there must be some adaptive changes. Sometimes it might be beneficial, and sometimes it might be pathological also. So in case of a microgravity, what happens? In case if you take a, a M mode echo, in case of a atrophy, in case of a you know microgravity, the uh, volume reduces. You know the cardiac thickness reduces, the cardiac mass reduces. And after returning, that's why if you see, you know, if, if you see the capsule when the astronaut returns back to the Earth, they literally carry them. You know, like they don't make them walk from the capsule. They, you know, like they are the people who literally help them to the, you know, like uh, you know, ambulance or something, right? It's possible experience that include that heart atrophy caused by weightlessness, dehydration from the space travel. So these two things reduces the chamber volume uh, to great extent in when you are in space. Okay. See, what are the other emergent property of the heart and uh, the heart rate variability? So the heart rate variability refers to the beat to beat alterations because within first beat and second beat, this to, the, uh, the, uh, the, the um, volume of current or the amount of electric current which is required for this uh, physiological electric current which is required might not be the same. Between first beat and second beat, it might be changing, right? That is called as heart rate variability. So in case of a younger heart, the heart rate variability is much more higher compared to the older heart. So if you see uh, an example, uh, for example, when there's a rescue operation, when there is somebody, you know, uh, a boat collapses in the river and everybody's on the life jacket. And if there's a rescue operation suddenly coming up, uh, suddenly the moment they see the, the old people, if they see the helicopter coming for rescue, they go immediately go for an arrest because uh, the joy that, you know, they're going to be saved. Right? And heart, older heart cannot adapt to the high, the low end and the high end changes, but an younger heart can adapt. So this is the heart rate variability. And this heart rate variability is also a, you know, like indicator for cardiac conditions, cardiac pathologies. So heart rate is a number of heartbeats per minute. Heart rate variability is fluctuation in time interval between two adjacent heart rate. Heart rate variability indices neurocardiac function and it is generated by heart brain interaction and dynamic non-linear automatic nervous system, autonomic nervous system process. Heart rate variability is an emergent property of the regulatory system, which operates on different time scales to help us adapt to the environmental and psychological challenges. Heart rate variability reflects regulations and autonomic balance. And blood pressure, gas changes, gut, heart, and vascular tone, which refers to the diameter of the blood vessel that regulate the BP and possibly the tissue muscles. Okay. So dynamic reorganization. It is uh, not in the physiological condition. It is not only in the exercise condition. Sometimes we do transplant these days. You know, like when there's a transplant, how does it heart, heart adapt? So this is in post-cardiac transplantation show that there's an emergence of nervous system during the first 100 days following the heart transplant and devoid of central control. There's no central control because when they do a cardiac transplant, you must be knowing, you know, there's a piggy, piggyback surgery. They don't completely revert you know, remove the heart and put a, you know, like a system over the computer system or, a, you know, a cyborg into it to function. Rather, part of the LV is removed and the recipient organ is, you know, the suture over it, the piggyback surgeries are done. So what happened really? So really in the first normal policy, this is called point care plotting. So if you see the graph, so see the changes, you know, like after these many days, after one week, there is some amount of changes which is taking place. And after... Uh, a month or so, the changes are different. And after, you know, seven, uh, seven and a half years, there is more amount of reorganization, neural neuroorganization, which takes place in the heart. So then there is a reorganization of the uh, neural system of the heart. Okay. So window period of the emerging heart rate variability. Two years is the window period required for the property of heart rate to become complex. So 80% of the car sudden cardiac death and cardiac arrhythmias is confined to this window period of two years following a transplantation. 
okay so so i would go into the brief uh, implications clinical implications right um, in case of an hypertension the prevailing view of hypertensive heart disease is that it leads to first to the concentric left ventricular hypertrophy then to ventricular dilatation and impaired contractility and systolic dysfunction and and with with the cardiac uh, concentric remodeling can in the case of hypertension eccentric hypertrophy has also been found to be associated with associated systolic dysfunction so and the extent to which left ventricular hypertrophy is a risk factor for systolic dysfunction may depend on whether the hypertrophy is concentric or eccentric so myocardial infarction late or long term remodeling after infarction include fibrosis and loss of contractile activity in the infarcted area increased wall stress in the ventricular region surrounding the infarct and progressive decomposition dilatation of the lv can also take place in case of a myocardial infarction so type 2 diabetes so you see that you know, uh, india is a hub for diabetes type 2 diabetes mainly is associated with the distinct syndrome of cardiac hypertrophy and di diastolic dysfunction known as the diabetic cardiomyopathy can happen in type 2 diabetes uh, hypertrophy in diabetic heart is associated with increase in echo density of the wall ventricular wall suggesting that the increase in the mass maybe this there the contractile element changes in other conditions sports and everything here there is fibrosis and there is a actual hypertrophy of the myocardium right so these are the references this is a brief idea about whether the uh, what are the changes which takes place in the heart and um, most of them know there is see there is a hypertrophy of the heart most of us think that is pathological cardiac hypertrophy can be beneficial and it can also be pathological so these are things um that's it so if you have any queries you can ask me i i think that the topic has gone hey why participants if you have any questions please use the raise hand option and you will be unmuted participants if you have any questions you can please raise your hands you will be unmuted uh, yes sir sir may i ask sir um main uh, nitin yes sir subramaniam yeah. sir sir. Subram. sir sir tell me sir please sir sure sir yes sir uh, sir uh, it's a wonderful presentation thank you and sir. it's a great learning a new topic yes sir uh, fine uh, congratulations amul mohan sir thanks nice sir. learning we have noted down Yes, uh, but the first question comes over here sir yes sir uh, you said remodeling is both physiological and pathological yes sir fine sir yes, anti remodeling therapy is it similar to cardiac rehabilitation sir it looks uh, to be yes sir yes sir because cardiac rehabilitation also involves exercise training isn't it sir so for example you know like uh, we fix up the exercise intensity uh, exercise intensity is fixed with the target heart rate so based on the target heart rate you load the heart and again any proper exercise that provides a proper stimulus to the heart and they can be remodeling so it is similar to cardiac rehabilitation it's a part of cardiac rehabilitation wonderful sir number one number two sir uh, you said aerobic exercises are beneficial in some cases rested exercises are beneficial is there any research uh, where a combination of aerobic and rested exercises uh, providing useful for anti remodeling therapy sir so actually like uh, uh, my research is uh, into it sir like i am doing it on amputation so uh, with the cardiac plasticity changes like um, see the remodeling can also happen with the uh, body uh, you know like surface area you know like uh, total body surface area changes if there is a cardiac remodeling uh, it could be also because of aerobic as well as concentric but as said there is no distinct research supporting concentric hypertrophy uh, it is only supporting the eccentric hypertrophy and uh, there is no specific research as of uh, which i have come across sir probably it might be there uh, it could be there sir one more sir as per the data uh, maybe uh, dr tanika jalam's uh, data the former uh, vice chancellor of ramchandra university yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, nearly about 20% of tamil nadu population are hypertensive yes, another uh, more than 20% are diabetic yes, maybe sir. obesity another every one in third yes, sir. Yes, so uh, from the clinical uh, part of it nearly you say about uh, the, the pathological remodeling may not be possible in these patients what is your opinion on that sir sir like the thing is that like see for example uh, 
every uh, in case if hypertension is being treated along with for example calcium channel blockers calcium channel blockers are much more beneficial when you give the treatment along with that you do an exercise uh, most often people depend upon the pharmacological uh, treatment rather than the non pharmacological treatment you know that exercise is a, uh, the biggest non pharmacological treatment when it is associated with this it can be beneficial and only when you go for regular follow up and review with the echocardiogram you will be able to identify if there is a change in it and as such this eccentric hypertrophy and concentric hypertrophy is not been considered because uh, there is no dysfunction in case if it is a dysfunction they might be uh, researching into it unless and until if there is a, no dysfunction or ventricular say, systolic dysfunction or a, a diastolic dysfunction it is not considered clinically it, it is not it is not life threatening and only for a person who involves in exercise might be concerned with that so i would support that you know like every hypertension to have a re regular follow up and uh, if, uh, on a regular follow up you should also go for an echo okay does that fine. answer your question sir yes sir yes sir yes sir sir one more last question i'll stop yes, with sir. this uh, sir uh, you have worked in apollo hospital i do have worked in the cardiac unit uh, with yes, from sir. them Yes, but in reality the cardiac rehabilitation is not taking off where is the lacuna because there is a lot of students are there pg people are there uh, it is only on paper is it yes, the sir. lack of faith by the cardiologist in physiotherapist or the lack of confidence by the physiotherapist what is your perception sir uh, thank you I, i think lack of faith of cardiologist on the physiotherapist sir <laughs> rather i think that you know like um, it is our domain exercise is our domain we have to convince a cardiologist saying that these are the benefits of it see for example like when we go for exercise if i wanted to check about the eccentric hypertrophy and concentric hypertrophy and athletes and i want to do a research the first question a cardiologist asks is there is going to be adaptation why do you want to check into it this, this i came across this right in case if you convince that saying that these are the supported documents and benefits can be attained through exercise definitely a cardiac rehabilitation can take care and only when therapist takes over in the, instead of a physiatrist he can do that sir absolutely we have uh, we have to rise up to that occasion yes, we have sir. to prove ourselves yes, have faith in it and establish thank you so much sir thank yes, you sir. thank you sir, sir uh, we have one more question in the chat box from uh, yes, shruti ma'am yes, the question is how do you relate cardiac plasticity in congenital heart diseases okay so again like congenital heart disease i was talking about aortic stenosis right so in case uh, see if you see that most of the treatment pertaining to heart is more of a surgical treatment not a pharmacological treatment you know so in case of a congenital heart disease it is more of a surgical treatment in the sense every issue which is happening in congenital heart disease is more mechanical in nature right for example there might be an aortic stenosis or there might be a mitral stenosis depending upon which valve is stenosed it can be a pressure overload in case if there is a regurgitation uh where, where the blood flows backwards then then is a volume overload it might be pathological right so uh, only when you know the condition for example in case of aortic stenosis which i was mentioning earlier uh, there is a stiffening of uh, stenosis uh, there is a stenosis a stenosis over there where the left ventricle has to push it has to work hard when you give a resistance to any muscle automatically it goes for hypertrophy right and when the stimulus is too hard when there is no uh, it is not corrected it might go into other changes rather it might go into uh, you know like electrical deorganization right so disorganization so it can happen so we should know what is the condition what kind of congenital pathology it is and then we can relate it to what kind of hypertrophy it can happen see again uh, most often if there is a pathology in the right side of the heart it's not going to be life threatening it might be uh, not to the extent of what happens in a left ventricle right so because the pressure changes on the left ventricle is much more pressure on the left ventricle more compared to the right ventricle you might be knowing it right so you should know which kind of where there is stenosis and what kind of pathology over it and how it can change to the left ventricle thank you sir yeah uh, pavan sir i don't think there is any more questions from the participants i guess like students <laughs> it's a it's a abstract topic people have not understood it isn't it pavan Yes, sir. Yes, sir. <laughs> They have not understood it. <laughs> yes, sir. Subramanian, so, uh, sir, you can throw some light, sir. Sir, uh, sir. Uh, number one is you touched on all three aspects of growing emerging field 
including yes, molecular biology, genetics, and regenerative medicine. So not only that, I think you must be knowing about the uh, gut-brain axis, microbiota on the uh, uh, abdomen. So that plays a major role in obesity. And even this contributes to the hypertrophy of the heart. Microbiota in the uh, gut plays a major role in, it also plays a major role in hypertrophy, sir. Which I have not specified earlier. I think my yes, small small request to all the participants, we should start focusing apart from routine uh, therapy, focus on more genetics, more on regenerative medicine and on molecular biology. These uh, three will be the uh, probably, you know, uh, next uh, decade emerging fields where we have to focus. Thank you, sir. Yes, sir. Because earlier, uh, it was something like earlier we thought that everything was completely uh, uh, microorganism dominated. Every condition which happens was microorganism dominated. Later, we were thinking about only microorganism. Then came genetics. So, genetic mapping was done. Crick's, uh, you know, like uh, Watson Crick's, they uh, did the genetic mapping. And they thought that every disease was uh, genetical only. And I think 2014, if I'm not wrong, 2014, India did uh, uh, protein mapping. So, now we start focusing on protein. You know, every patient which happens because of the protein dysfunction or anything. Science has gone to an extent that we are, we, they are making us eat the shit, you know. You must have heard about fecal transplant therapy. You know, like a normal fecus has been cryo uh, freezed and they are given in capsule form for cert certain condition. In case of obesity also, they do it. So science is emerging. You know, like there's a lot of changes which is happening. And my idea is that please read and look out of the box. You know, like uh, instead of reading into the same domain, there are a lot of science book which is written by several authors apart from, you know, the, uh, you know, like uh, journals and other stuff. They give a lot of input about a lot of things like this. So please read some books like, you know, like Selfish Gene, uh, Phantoms in the Brain, Intriguing Brain, Telltale Brain, or books like, you know, like um, uh, Homo Deus. 